This is Earth. Earth is the only home we have ever known. The Earth is 4.6 billion years old, but a human lifetime often lasts for less than 100 years. So why care about the history of our planet when the distant past seems so inconsequential to everyday life? When I was a kid, I used to look up at the stars and think, what else is out there? Now I study geology, and I've come to appreciate a different view, one which is looking down upon Earth from space. You see, as far as we can tell, Earth is the only planet in our solar system known to have sparked life, and the only system able to provide life support for human beings. So why Earth? We know Earth is unique for having plate tectonics, liquid water on its surface, and an oxygen-rich atmosphere. But this has not always been the case, and we know this because ancient rocks have recorded the pivotal moments in Earth's planetary evolution. And one of the best places to observe those ancient rocks is in the Pilbara of Western Australia. Since 2013, I've spent my winters in the heart of the Pilbara, mapping what is now a desolate countryside, but was once an active volcanic landscape. The rocks here are 3.5 billion years old, and they contain some of the oldest evidence for life on the planet. Now, often when we think of early life, we might imagine a stegosaurus, or maybe a fish crawling onto land. But the early life that I'm talking about is simple, microscopic life like bacteria. And their fossils are often preserved as layered rock structures called stromatolites. This simple form of life is almost all we see in the fossil record for the first three billion years of life on Earth. I've often gazed out over the landscapes that contain these fossils and wondered, if these rocks could talk, what might they say? Today, there are 7.7 .7 billion human beings on this planet. Our species can only be traced back in the fossil record to a few hundred thousand years ago. In that time, it is estimated that 108 billion humans have roamed the Earth. But, if you were to unravel the length of an average toilet roll and at one end put the most minute tick, this would represent all of human history in comparison to the age of Earth. If you were then to move down that toilet roll 20 or so sheets, this would represent 600 million years ago, where we see the transition from a world dominated by microscopic life to a world where life has become big and complex plants, animals, and eventually, humans. At the beginning of the toilet roll, the early Earth had formed, and maybe five or ten sheets in, life had begun. We know from the fossil record that bacteria, life, had grabbed a strong foothold by about 3.5 to 4 billion years ago. But rocks older than this have been either destroyed or highly deformed through plate tectonics. So what remains a missing piece of the puzzle is exactly when and how life on Earth began. So here again is that ancient volcanic landscape in the Pilbara. Little did I know that our research here would provide another clue to that origin of life puzzle. It was on my first field trip here, toward the end of a four-long week mapping project, that I came across something rather special. It was nearing the end of a long and hot day, and there were still a number of ridges between me and camp, so I had decided to clamber up a narrow gully on the next ridge, just about here, as a shortcut home. With foot and hand, I made my way up that gully, until about halfway, I looked up and came across what I thought was an intriguing outcrop. 
Now, what probably looks like a bunch of wrinkly old rocks are actually stromatolites. And at the center of this mound was a small, peculiar rock about the size of a child's hand. I hurriedly took some notes and packed away this finding. It took six months before we inspected this rock under a microscope, where one of my mentors at the time, Malcolm Walter, suggested the rock resembled geyserite. Now, in order for you to understand the significance of geyserite, I need to take you back a couple of centuries. In 1871, in a letter to his friend Joseph Hooker, Charles Darwin suggested, what if life started in some warm little pond with all sorts of chemicals still ready to undergo more complex changes? Well, we know of warm little ponds, we call them hot springs, and they form in volcanic landscapes such as Yellowstone National Park. This one is Grand Prismatic Spring. In these environments, you have hot water dissolving minerals from the underlying rocks. This solution mixes with organic compounds and results in a kind of chemical factory, which researchers have shown can manufacture simple cellular structures that are the first steps toward life. Now, in the modern environments, this chemical matter is devoured by life. And this rainbow of colors that you see around Grand Prismatic Spring are various heat-loving microbes, many of which are feeding purely off the chemical matter coming out of this hot pond. But 100 years after Darwin's letter, deep-sea hydrothermal vents, or hot vents, were discovered in the ocean. And these are also chemical factories. This one is located along the Tonga Volcanic Arc, 1,100 meters below sea level in the Pacific Ocean. The black smoke that you see billowing out of these chimney-like structures is also mineral-rich fluid, which is being fed off by bacteria. And since the discovery of these deep sea vents, the favored scenario for an origin of life has been in the ocean. And this is for good reason. Deep sea vents are well known in the ancient rock record. And it's thought that the early Earth had a global ocean and very little land surface. So the probability that deep sea vents were abundant on the very early Earth fits well with an origin of life in the ocean. However, our research in the Pilbara provides and supports an alternative perspective. So after Malcolm had suggested that the little rock I'd collected might be geyserite, my colleagues and I began to gather as much information about that little rock as we could and about the context in which it lay. After three years, finally, we were able to show that, in fact, our little rock was geyserite. Now, geyserite is a rock type that only forms in and around the edges of hot spring pools. So this conclusion suggested not only did hot springs exist in our 3.5 billion year old volcano in the Pilbara, but it pushed back evidence for life living on land in hot springs in the geological record of Earth by three billion years. And so, from a geological perspective, Darwin's warm little pond is a reasonable origin of life candidate. Of course, it's still debatable how life began on Earth, and it probably always will be. But it is clear that it's flourished, it has diversified, and it has become ever more complex. Eventually, it reached the age of the human, a species that has begun to question its own existence and the existence of life elsewhere. Is there a cosmic community waiting to connect with us? Or are we all there is? A clue to this puzzle, again, comes from the ancient rock record. At about 2.5 billion years ago, there is evidence that bacteria have begun to produce oxygen, kind of like plants do today. Geologists refer to the period that followed as the great oxidation event. 
It is implied from rocks called banded iron formations, many of which can be observed as hundreds of meter thick packages of rock which are exposed in gorges that carve their way through the Karajini National Park in Western Australia. These iron-rich deposits are thought to have formed when iron in an ancient ocean combined with oxygen produced by the bacteria, the product of which is rust, which settled out of the water column and onto the sea floor, ultimately building up the banded iron formations. The arrival of free oxygen allowed two major changes to occur on our planet. First, it allowed complex life to evolve. You see, life needs oxygen to get big and complex. And it produced the ozone layer, which protects modern life from the harmful effects of the sun's UVB radiation. So in an ironic twist, microbial life made way for complex life and in essence relinquished its three billion year reign over the planet. Today, we humans dig up fossilized complex life and burn it for fuel. This practice pumps vast amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And like our microbial predecessors, we have begun to make substantial changes to our planet. And the effects of those are encompassed by global warming. Unfortunately, the ironic twist here could see the demise of humanity. And so maybe the reason we aren't connecting with life elsewhere, intelligent life elsewhere, is that once it evolves, it extinguishes itself quickly. The rock record has given us many insights. From an environment with the right conditions fit to spark life, to the microbes that generated oxygen and endorsed complex life, and now to humans, who in just the last few hundred years have developed machines far more powerful than any microbial metabolism, machines that pump vast amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, rapidly warming the planet and tampering with our current life support system. If the rocks could talk, I suspect they might say this. Life on Earth is precious. It is the product of four or so billion years of a delicate and complex co-evolution between life and Earth, of which humans only represent the very last speck of time. You can use this information as a guide or a forecast, or an explanation as to why it seems so lonely in this part of the galaxy but use it to gain some perspective about the legacy that you want to leave behind on the planet that you call home. Thank you.